Welcome back to 60 Minutes and our special report on the Lindt Cafe siege. As the chaos unfolded that Monday morning, fear and panic swept through the cafe. The gunman had declared that this was an attack by Islamic State and he claimed there was a bomb in his backpack. Hostages knew they had to appease him in an effort to stop him killing them. But for a few, there was only one focus, escape. It's now early afternoon. Martin Place looks like a battle zone. Much of the city has been evacuated. Hi, Mark. Um, yep, um, Inside the cafe, the hostages are making increasingly frantic calls to the media to pass on the gunman's demands. We understand the Prime Minister is a very busy man. However, I think, you know, the lives of quite a few people here are more important than whatever he's doing right now, whether he's playing I golf understand. or walking with his dog. I don't know what the hell he's doing. The phone calls are being made under duress. The gunman listening to every word. But the frustration of the hostages is real. At the request of police, the media is not reporting any of the gunman's demands. We can't say whether this is uh, an Islamic extremist engaged. Well, publicly, we don't know who these people, uh, who this person is. Uh, they haven't apparently identified themselves. So... ...into the cafe. They will then try to talk to the people who are inside that cafe. Perhaps it's just somebody doing this in order to attract attention. We were sitting there and thinking, we've told all this radio and the negotiator what his demands were and they'll still broadcast it, it had no idea what it is. He was getting frustrated, and so were we, because it was our only hope out. The gunman decides Jared Morton Hoffman is the problem. He said, look, Jared, you've done a great job, in a kind of sarcastic tone, but you're just too calm. He goes, we need someone who's going to cry to the media so that they put something on. So you got sacked? <laughs> I got sacked, yes. Jared is put back on window duty with his mate Joel, where their thoughts turn to a more final way to end this ordeal. You do have the Stanley knife yeah. and you do have the scissors. Yeah. Did it occur to you? Of course. I've got these weapons. Yeah, I mean... I might have to use them. I mean, there was a time when I, when I was standing, you know, holding the flag and he was, you know, right below me sitting on the lounge and do, do I stab him, you know, but what if I miss? What are the consequences of that, you know? Yeah. Who is he going to shoot? He could kill us all, you know, I mean... If I get it wrong. Exactly. If I miss, what if I, you know, dive at him, kick the gun in his hand and, and stab him? But, you know, I, I, just, I just couldn't end up doing it. I just... just yeah. I just couldn't. I've got this knife in my pocket, and I know Joel has a knife in his pocket. And we are so close, we could do this. But, you know, someone would need to jump, hold his arms down, and then I would stab him in the jugular. But he had his gun, he had it on his knee, and I could see that it was pointed directly at Julie Taylor's back. The risks were too great. Yeah. Mm. And so we, we never did it. Across the cafe, Paolo Vasalo is thinking he's got to get out. I couldn't take it any longer in there. I couldn't. I just really couldn't. Many people were obviously thinking, how are we going to get out of here? Yeah. That was your focus? It was, yeah. It definitely was. I, I've got kids at home and, um, yeah, I, that was my main, you know, just thinking about them. Paolo's great mate and boss, Tori Johnson, Stand. is doing it tough. Don't do anything silly. The gunman didn't like Tori, did he? No, he didn't. He, he, he had it in for him from the beginning and uh, he, he kept referring to him as manager, manager. If anything's not right and you're lying, you know, you sort of imply that you'll be the first one to get shot. You said that the gunman hated Tori with a passion. He did. What made you think that? I think it was his authority figure in the sense that he was a manager. 
I think it, he felt like it undermined him. Under constant threat like that, Tory must have felt the burden. Yeah, he did, and uh, he, he, Tory was brave. He was. He wasn't leaving Tory. I think he, he wasn't leaving. I could see his, his eyes, and I, I knew he, whatever happened that day, I knew in his eyes that he was going to stay there to the end, and uh, I had no doubt about that. He was like the captain of the ship. That's right. He wasn't, he wasn't leaving. Knowing that Tori won't join him, Paolo confides his escape plan to Fiona after she's been allowed to escort him to the bathroom. I just gave her a kiss and I gave her a hug. And I said, we're, we're going to go. We're going now. You're coming with me. And uh, she was shaking a little bit. And um, she sort of, she's like, I can't, I can't. And I said, why, Fiona? Why, you just got to come on. Uh, I, I tried, I tried so hard. I can't leave people behind because I wouldn't be able to live with, you know, the guilt if something, you know, happened to everyone else. So, like, I, I made the choice to stay behind until, like, you know, the very end. For mother and daughter, Robin and Louisa Hope, the choices are few. Louisa has multiple sclerosis and uses a walking stick. Did that weigh on your mind at all? That uh, of all the people in the room, we're, we're the two that probably will have to sit this out? That's right. I'm not exactly able to run and my mother is elderly. So, you know, the reality, our reality was, was that we really did have to wait for the police to come. And you did. Yes. And we did. And we did. You stood up to him at one point. Well, I just thought no one else had, and I thought, well, I'll have a go. And I just wanted to let him know that I wasn't impressed with what he was choosing to do with all of our lives. Do you remember what you said? Yeah, just that. I just don't like your attitude. It's not a, an attitude of how we run. We don't need this. We come in here for, for refreshments. So when you hear your mum confronting this man with a gun, threatening you all. Exactly. What do you do? At one point, um, he had said to me, Louisa, keep your mother quiet. And so I just turned my head and directly said to her, Mum, you're an old lady, be quiet. <laughs> I'm a 72-year-old lady. And then she had another go. And I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> she's, she's stands up and she says, I want to go to the bathroom and my daughter needs her medication. Come on. Toilets, toilets this way. And then everything changes. What changed? Well, suddenly he's like, Louisa, what do you have medication for? Well, I have medication for MS. What's MS? And then he inquires very, like he's totally interested. Let me know if you need medicine. But any pleasantries by the gunman... You! ...are shortly... White shirt man, no talking! OK, OK. Sitting at the front of the cafe, 82-year-old John O'Brien and barrister Stefan Balafutis are quietly plotting their escape, as is Paolo Vasalo. Were you aware that uh, John and Stefan were talking and...? No, nah, I had no idea. ..planning their escape? No idea at all. No idea at all. Without warning, John and Stefan leap from their seats and bolt to the front door. And I just heard this bang. And they were running and they hit this green button, which was the bang I'd heard, and they ran out. I saw John go through. It's even going to be now or it's, it may be never. And I ran, yeah, I, I didn't turn around. And me running, there was a chance I could make it, but there was just as much chance I could have got shot. Back inside the cafe, there is breathe. chaos. Yes! Can't can three of us they left. The tables move. There's water glass that's shattered on the floor. 
and I thought he was going to shoot somebody. I pushed myself off the seat and I fell right on the ground because if he shoots, he'll shoot up, he won't shoot down. And he said, what's it, what, what's it? And he just freaked out. He was just gasping for air. He was, he was kind of... Uh, the gunman's gasping yeah, for yeah, air? Yeah, he was like, uh, uh, you know, like trying to comprehend what, what had just happened. Where are the, where are the three, where are those, where is the, where's the guy with the white shirt? He's got, you know, all of us in a human shield around him. And he's talking really, really fast. And he's saying, the police, the police have helped them. I have to kill, I have to kill you now. Someone has to die. Someone has to die. And he said, right, eye for an eye. Who, who you, you know, you're three gone, I have to three shoot, shoot three of you. I thought, oh, Christ. And, these, and they're standing there, and he literally was poised. It was very hard. We had to beg for our lives. I just started saying, like, the police didn't help him. The police didn't help them. They just ran out. He started to calm down for a second, and he goes, like, oh, Jared, you... You just, if you didn't speak faster, I would have killed someone. I was going to shoot you, but thank you, Jared. So he has you in this state of, I'm about to die, and then he turns and says, well, thanks for that. Yes. Did you feel angry that the first hostages had run? I was... Yeah, I guess you could say I was, you know, I was angry because this is very, very dangerous now. I was upset in, this, in the fact that they had left us. From away. that That's moment it. on, no one okay. is in any doubt about the fate of hostages left behind if there is another escape. Coming up, a secret revealed. When did you find out Harriet was pregnant? Uh, uh, she told me in one of the five room trips. The gunman warns the hostages. If someone else leaves, someone dies. But two more make their escape. She was pulling the, the side door. That's next on 60 Minutes.